Graag heet ik. Ik like to welcome you to this online program from the um, Royal Dutch Academy of Arts and Science. Today we're presenting the most important results of the research independence, decolonization, violence and war in Indonesia, a joint program of three institutes. The Royal Institute for Southeast Asian and Caribbean Studies, KITAD, the Netherlands Institute for Military History, the NIMH, and the New York Institute for War, Holocaust and Genocide Studies. Uh, this research has been carried out over the past four and a half years by a team of over 25 Dutch researchers divided over eight different research projects. In some of these projects uh, was close collaboration with foreign colleagues, including a team of Indonesian historians. But more on that subject later. A large part of the Dutch researchers and some of their Indonesian colleagues will personally explain the results of their research project over the next few hours, and that will be done in the form of a very program in which videos, short pictures, and interviews alternate. These interviews will be conducted by the historian Hans Goedkoop. We have asked, uh, because of his professionalism, involvement, and knowledge of the war in Indonesia and its aftermath. This morning's program consists of two parts, and after the second break, it will conclude with a presentation of the conclusions of the research at noon exactly. That is also the start of the press conference. It is possible to ask substantive questions of the researchers about their presentations. This can be done via the email address info at ind45-50.nl. We hope to be able to answer some of these questions during this broadcast. We will provide a written response to the remaining questions. As I've said, we will conclude at 12 noon with the presentation of the conclusions and the press conference. This part can also be followed live via this same channel, but also via the online channels of the NOS. The most important results of the research have been brought together in this publication, over the grens, Dutch extreme violence in the Indonesian War of Independence. It's a publication of Amsterdam University Press, which is available as of today, and it is also published in English, and it is titled Beyond the Pale. The Indonesian translation uh, will be published this spring. A total of 14 publications uh, will come from this research program, excluding translations. In addition to Beyond the Pale, four partial publications will appear today, and very important, as of the 1st of March, these publications will also be available digitally uh, and free of charge. The remaining books and anthologies that will come from this program will be published over the coming months. And then finally, you can imagine that the presentation of the results of the research uh, can evoke strong emotions. If you want to talk to someone about this, you can contact the Polita Foundation via telephone number 0883305111. Veterans and their loved ones can also contact the Veterans Desk of the Netherlands Veterans Institute via phone number 0883340000. I would now like to give the floor to Program Director Frank van Vrij for a more detailed explanation of the research, how it was arrived at, how it was done. Frank van Vrij is a emeritus professor of history of war, conflict and remembrance at the University of Amsterdam and was director of NIELT until September 2021. Frank, please go ahead. Yes, thank you, Mariette. Ladies and gentlemen, in 1969, India, the veteran Frank van Hutte in an interview said that he and other soldiers during their time in Indonesia had committed war crimes. The government then did an inventory of the archives, a very brief one, and based on that concluded that during the wars, war in 
the time of 1945 to 1915, excesses had been committed, but that the armed forces as a whole acted correctly. And that was a quote. And that government position from 1969 has not been reviewed since. Over the last few years, however, there were stronger and stronger indications, also based on court cases, especially that of the uh, Committee of Dutch Debts of Honor, media articles and uh, historic research that the Dutch military would used excessive violence on a larger scale than was ever admitted by the Dutch authorities. Society and science urged that more research was done into the actions of the military. In early 2017, the government decided to make 4 million euros available in order to support a joint research program of uh, KITLV, KNAW, and the NEOD. That program started in mid-2017 and is being uh, completed today, six months later than planned because of the COVID crisis. That meant the archives as well were in lockdown and it was impossible to do um, field research. This research program, which was just described by Mariette Wolf, was divided up into a number of sub-projects and the most important findings have been put, have been brought together in the um, uh, conclusions we're talking about today. So the purpose of the research was offering a further explanation for the actions of the Dutch military in the period in Indonesia from 1945 to 1915 with attention for historic political international context and also for the international and political aftermath of the war from 1950 to 2020. This analysis and this explanation was focused, first of all, on the use of extreme violence um, by the Dutch armed forces and the consequences of that, and secondly, focused on the question uh, to what degree uh, political and legal responsibility was taken at the time and later for this violence. And of course, we're not the first ones to be involved in the subject. I already said that attention for the war and uh, the, the violence has increased over the past few years, and you see that in um, the various history books. We've built on that, starting with the scientific work that started in the 70s with Van Dorn and Hendricks, both veterans and sociologists, up to Limpach's uh, thesis in 2016. In this program, with the research question that I've just told you about as a starting point, we wanted to bring all the existing research together uh, to start with, and we wanted to do further investigation into important blind spots like the workings of the intelligence services, the use of heavy um, weaponry, the violence, the first stage of the uh, Indonesian revolution, that in the Netherlands is known as the Bersiap period, communication from the battleground to The Hague, and how the history was dealt with after 1950, but also international comparisons with other colonial wars. Thirdly, we wanted to offer room to various perspectives of people in the Netherlands, people in Indonesia who were part of this history, and we wanted to give these people a voice. Fourthly, we wanted collaboration between Dutch and Indonesian researchers, and we wanted to use a broad palette of sources in Indonesia and other countries. Finally, Based on that older and newer research, we wanted to arrive at new insights and we wanted a more comprehensive picture of this history of war and violence where it concerned the Netherlands. As I was saying, the focus of the program was first of all on the use of extreme violence by the Dutch armed forces and the consequences of that, and secondly, on the question uh, of to what degree any responsibility was taken at the time. But then, of course, the question is, what is extreme violence? Well, extreme violence is an analytical concept which allows us to 
first of all, stay away from legal frameworks and concepts of then and now because those frameworks and concepts in the 40s and 50s were changing greatly and in many cases were the product of colonial relationships. Secondly, it enables us to use extreme violence as an overarching uh, concept for violence that even by the standards of the time was beyond the pale. This extreme violence ha took many forms. It uh, took place outside of regular combat situations or in their margins, often without a direct military need or necessity, or without a clearly defined military target like torture, summary executions, uh, abuse, rape, looting, theft, detention under inhumane circumstances, violent reprisals like torching kampongs and shooting uh, civilians and mass detention. The violence took place within regular combat operations. That also comes under extreme violence when we're talking about the use of heavy and light weaponry where the use of violence was disproportionate and where deliberately uh, a great risk were taken of civilian casualties. So the presentations you'll see today are all to do with that a principal question. So that's the further analysis and a further explanation of the uh, nature of the Dutch actions in Indonesia placed in a historical and international context and then that focus on the use of extreme violence. So these questions were leading in our program for which the government in February 2017 granted a uh, subsidy. So this program was not a government assignment. It was an independent uh, scientific, and, uh, scientific research, which was in part financed by the government, but which the government was not involved in any further. So that is the reason that these conclusions are not being offered to the government, but here, are being offered to society at the Royal Netherlands Academy of Arts and Sciences. So as a program over the years, we've tried to be transparent in what we've done. And we've talked to various groups in the Netherlands. In part, we did that in an organized way. We had a, a sounding board group with seven uh, civil society organizations were included. They were very critical uh, sparring partners, forcing the researchers to, uh, holding the researchers accountable for that work. But there were other groups we talked to as well. So we talked to Jeffrey Ponda's uh, Committee of Dutch Debts of Honor. We talked to Indonesian students in the Netherlands. And also we talked to the Federation of Dutch Indos. And yesterday, much too late, we talked to the uh, Indonesian platform 2.0, which yesterday tried in vain via summary relief proceedings to stop publication today. They tried in vain. But after that, we did talk to them. And we'll continue to talk to them. Finally, there was also an International Scientific Advice Committee who's been reading along to see if our work complied with the usual standards for scientific research. And they uh, were very strict in doing so. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the outline of the program of which the results will be presented today. Um, and at about noon, we'll be presenting the most important conclusions. In September 2016, in September 2016, a publication, The Burning Kampongs of General Spoor, um, was published by historian Remy Limpach. For the government, this study was the last push to decide to fund a further investigation into the violence of the Dutch armed forces in Indonesia. Remy Limpach is a senior researcher at NIMH and project leader of the three sub-studies that are housed at this institute. He himself was in charge of the sub-study on the intelligence services, which will be published later this year under the title Stumbling in the Dark, Intelligence Struggle During the Indonesian War of Independence. Hans Goedkoop 
will talk to Remy Limpach about the results of this study. Hans, you have the floor. Thank you. Remy, uh, good morning. Uh, everyone, good morning. It's very early, uh, 9 a.m. You have noticed that the most important conclusions of this report were leaked last night, as it should be, and that is all the more reason for us to go more deeper into a very complex historical reality underlying all that. So, Remy, just um, starting with the uh, burning kampongs that Mariette already referred to, in 2016, you became part of a long-running discussion about extreme violence committed by the Dutch in the Indonesian War of Independence, but you arrived at a conclusion which, until then, no one had dared to draw. Um, violence was not incidental, it was systemic or structural. It was part of the whole military organization, and then, boom, there was a discussion, a debate that had never been held before on this subject. Why all of a sudden did it happen then? That's a good question. To be honest, when I started with my archive research at the time, I didn't really see that coming. I think probably it's a sign that the Netherlands, like other nations, uh, sometimes struggles uh, with uh, the, the dark side of its own history. When I was in the archives, that those court cases mentioned before uh, were starting, especially that uh, court case on Ravaka Day, where Indonesian widows uh, won their fight against the Dutch state. It led to apologies, compensation, etc. And of course, it also led to a great deal of media attention Right, so that past, you can't just push it away. Uh, it, it always comes back. Yes, it, it comes and goes. Attention would, you know, disappear again, would drop off. But the court case has really put it back on the agenda. And then after that, you had uh, questions from research institutes, media attentions, for example, in uh, the trash, a um, photo album of executions was found. There were other factors as well, museums, writers. So for you, after I think about 800 pages in your book, what were the questions still left open at the time? Well, it's true that I, I wrote quite a, a, a lot of pages, but no book is all encompassing. We're talking about a conflict with hundreds of thousands of uh, troops on both sides. It lasted so many years. There were many islands involved. So it was a very extensive archipelago. So one book can't cover all of that. And at the end of my book, I did indicate what the remaining questions were, where, where more research needed to be done. And what were those areas? Well, there were a number of areas. A few have been mentioned already, and one of them I, I now looked into myself. So looking into the uh, intelligence services, heavy weaponry, uh, military justice, international comparisons. So those are a few examples where I was aware at the time that, that further study was required. And when I started, when I started my research, there was very little information on the subject, and I made a start of it, but it wasn't a complete picture just yet. Right, so you looked into the intelligence services. Um, I thought that was a surprising choice. Initially, it was, you know, the whole army. That was 200,000 people that you looked at. But now the intelligence services, that's very small. That's only a few thousand uh, men. Why is that so important? Well, we're talking about a war that was mostly a guerrilla war. And then intelligence is crucial. You know, a guerrilla war is... Uh, characterized by what are called hit-and-run actions. So the, the enemy and the opponent is hard to tell apart from the civilian population. So in this case, for the Dutch armed forces, it was very hard to find their opponents. So then you're very dependent on intelligence. And intelligence... You know, it's also important for other subjects too. Intelligence services also had administrative uh, jobs, uh, police work that they did. So really, it's a very broad field. 
So you quoted someone who said something like an, an army without an intelligence service is like a, a boxer without eyes. Yeah, like a blindfolded boxer, that's right. Right, a blindfolded boxer. So from your research, I get the impression that the intelligent, Dutch intelligence services still were kind of like a blindfolded boxer. How do they operate? Well, that's very interesting. I didn't just focus on violence that was committed. I also look at the uh, overarching or the wider intelligence struggle, for example, uh, spying, uh, infiltration, etc. So clearly, when it came to intelligence, Indonesians did much better. They were much more inventive. And of course, they, they had the home advantage. Yes, exactly, and they had more means, they were more determined as well, but also they were they outwitted the Dutch in, in many ways. For example, to a great degree, they infiltrated the military and civilian authorities, so they often knew what the Dutch were planning in advance. All right, well, so you looked at the intelligence services and you found extreme violence at an incredible scale. Can you give us an impression of that? Yes. Well, that'll be a slightly longer story. I will try to just be brief. Feel free to interrupt me. But if I can just go into the previous subject, what was interesting about the Indonesian intelligence services, really there was an asymmetry uh, that was to the advantage of the Indonesians. And that was one of the most important factors for the Dutch armed forces being unable to win the war in spite of superior uh, arms. So then the violence. There was a great range of extreme violence uh, inside and outside of interrogation centers. Of course, torture was already known, especially because of Joop Hooting. And what I noticed about the torture is that they didn't just torture people to get intelligence, but also to get confessions. And the victims then often confessed to things that they were accused of in order to stop the torture. And the indirect consequence of that was that uh, Indonesians were sometimes uh, convicted or found guilty or condemned to death because of false confessions. Um, but the intelligence services were guilty of a large range of violence. I can give more examples if you like. Well, maybe just one example. Well, many detainees who'd given up all they could give up and who were found useless after, the, after that interrogation, they were often killed. And in addition, there were small arrest teams, kill teams, who behind the scenes uh, targeted what they called Indonesian gang leaders. And what I thought was even more shocking is that uh, the intelligence services in some places just had a clear reign of terror in order to intimidate the population. And also there were fatal consequences of false intelligence. Right, so that's kind of terror at a large scale. So not just focused on individual, but target individuals, but targeting entire communities. Why? What are the causes of this pattern? Well... Often it uh, follows from a feeling of powerlessness, uh, frustration, feeling like you've got your back against the wall. You know, not being able to handle a conflict with normal military means. So then it is very tempting to use more extreme means. In Empire Combo in uh, Western Sumatra, for example, one of those places where I found this reign of terror, there... In the Minangkabau region, it was that was a region seen as Republican, and it was a spy from Singapore reporting that that region was pro-Dutch, in fact, and that was in part why Spore uh, gave the order to uh, conquer that region. But it turned out not to be the case, and there, uh, the Dutch found fierce Republican resistance. They had their backs against the wall because of it, so they felt forced to do public executions, to torture people in bright daylight, just to deter the population and to make sure that they didn't support Republican fighters. So uh, that violence, was that very local and, and quite far away? Was it 
violence that officers and higher-ups were aware of? Well, it depends on the case. Torture, that was something everyone knew up, up to the highest levels, and that was condoned. It was concealed, as, and it was also uh, pretty much not punished. Because that was an important question you wanted to investigate. So in that military hierarchy, where did they have the knowledge of this violence? Up to where did they know? Was it condoned? Was it was it promoted? Well, it was certainly condoned, and torture was was policy. So you, you, you're presenting it as a self evidence, but it's quite a, a major point. Well, in the war, you know, you weigh various interests, and in this case, apparently, the interest of getting intelligence that was deemed crucial outweighed uh, legal and ethical principles. All right, thank you very much, Remy. Mariette, het woord is weer aan jou. Ja. Binnen het onderzoeksproject. Within the Regional Studies Research Project, Dutch researchers collaborated intensively with Indonesian historians. Over the course of this spring, the project will result in the joint English language collection Revolutionary Worlds, local perspectives and dynamics during the Indonesian independence war, which will also be released or published in Indonesian. In the following filmed triptych, some of the Dutch and Indonesian coordinators and researchers tell more about their collaboration. Irene Hogen. Boom, affiliated with uh, Kit LV and coordinator of the Indonesian Dutch Corporation, explains the research project. Then, the Indonesian historian Farab Faki and the Dutch historian Martijn Eikhoff, also since September 2021 director of NIOT, in the form of a Zoom consultation, what this collaboration has yielded in terms of new insights. And then finally, the Indonesian project leader and historian Abdul Wahid explains the value of the joint research project for historiography in Indonesia. Welcome to the presentation of the Regional Studies Project. My name is Irene Hogenboom. I'm the coordinator of the Dutch Indonesian Cooperation. This cooperation has been established four years ago together with Rolf Racking, Martijn Eikhoff and Henk Schulten-Oorsholt, with our Indonesian counterparts Bambang Purwanto, Julianti and Abdul Wahid from the Gajamara University. I will shortly introduce you to how and why this cooperation came into being. And then Farah Bifaki and Martijn Eikhoff, two of the researchers, and Abdul Wahid will take over. The intention of the subproject, Regional Studies, was to connect Dutch and Indonesian historians in a research concerning the dynamics and context of violence in several Indonesian regions during the independence war. The idea was to compare the historiographies and to exchange sources and perspectives. To make this cooperation work, we decided to create two separate projects, each with its own research agenda. However, the focus of the program was the same, being the regional approach. This gave us ample opportunity to set the two historiographies in a dialogue and to explore the bridges between the narratives. Together, we set out to examine the different layers and complexities of the Indonesian independence war in the regions North and West Sumatra, West, Central and East Java, Bali and South Sulawesi. The Dutch researchers focused on the context of Dutch military violence at the time, while the Indonesian colleagues would assess the impact of that violence on society and how people in different places started shaping a new nation, and what it meant to be an Indonesian. We, 11 Indonesian and 7 Dutch researchers, started in November 2017 in Yogyakarta, and we've had yearly workshops since then. In between workshops, people also met each other and did research in both Indonesia and the Netherlands. The most valuable part of the workshops, however, were the discussions on the sources, perspectives and terminology. These discussions we continued over the years and once the workshops were taking place online because of the pandemic, they were also joined by members of other projects of the Otroi program. The problem of us, I think the problem is most of us as a historian, we really trap into what I call it the the, the, the language of, of sources. You know, we are trapped in the language of sources. 
and 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 when we bring our perspective to the to to to, to the sources to some extent we have some difficulty how to present it into the uh, into the historical uh, construction that's a problem for me then i prefer to use indonesian archipelago so in bahasa indonesia i call it kepulauan indonesia but but i will use indonesia i will use indonesia after you know indonesian declare independence but before that i'm i i prefer to use indonesian archipelago that's that's what i i, I like to do but to some extent i will i will also use the dutch colony or the the the, the Netherlands in this government to the special context so i think we cannot you know puzzle by this kind of, of of situation but we have to be precise the results of our cooperation will be presented in a joint edited volume that is scheduled for coming june the title is revolutionary worlds local perspectives and dynamics during the indonesian independence war in the next presentation farabi faki and martin aiko will explain a little bit more about the concept of revolutionary worlds and will illustrate how exchanging perspectives can work in practice Finally, project coordinator Abdul Wahid will give an overview of the Indonesian research at the Gadjah Mada University. Many thanks for this introduction to the Regional Studies Project, Irene. And hi Abi, good to see you. Hi Martijn. Yeah. I'm Martijn, a historian and as part of the regional, regional studies group. I studied the course of events in Central Java during the Indonesian War of Independence from multiple perspectives. One of the first things I realized after we started this project was that when different stories touch, they change. And we saw this happening when we exchanged histories based in diverting uh, national, in this case Indonesian and Dutch, backgrounds. This was even the case when they seemed incompatible, at least at first sight. Following this experience, the members of this group soon began discussing the implications of different chronologies, terms and perspectives. And these are crucial elements that constitute these diverting stories. In the course of this exchange, the title that connected all the different themes emerged, Revolutionary Worlds. It helped us investigating the plurality of what I was used to call the decolonization war and opened up a perspective that offers plenty of room for diverting voices and experiences. The term Revolutionary Worlds acknowledges that many people were aware that something big was happening in Indonesia. It was a revolution that was prepared for decades, but after 1945, the revolutionary energy was unparalleled, while the outcome was still far from certain. Revolutionary Worlds also refers to two important historiographical shifts. For the Dutch, including me, who traditionally focus on violence and war, it implies acknowledging that there was actually a revolution going on. While for the Indonesian members of the group, it implies acknowledging that there existed fragmented worlds behind the traditional story of one unified national revolution. And having said that, I would like to give the world to my colleague, Mas Abi. Thanks, Martijn. The project is immensely important, not because it can finally determine who is wrong or who is right, but because it is the beginning of a true dialogue between two peoples and civilizations that are deeply intertwined, but also lacking a deep understanding between one another. It is an acknowledgement that history has brought us two peoples together, maybe kicking and screaming, but that perhaps coming to terms with our past requires us to work together and understand our differences that perhaps we may never reach the same position on some topics, but that our basic agreement is that this should be a dialogue 
and that we should face our past together. Let this dialogue for decolonization commence for the next 300 years. One of the major ideas used in the book is that of revolutionary worlds. Now, I've uh, understood this to mean that the revolution was multi-layered and multi-dimensional with various parties from different ethnicities, ideologies, class, genders, and so forth. Uh, yet they were all engaged, maybe willingly or not, in the revolutionary changes within their specific worlds. In my research, I found that the revolutionary capital of Yogyakarta was a symbolic space that was used by the Republican elite and Indonesian state to promote the existence of a morally righteous and enlightened state to both the Indonesian and international public, but at the same time was contradicted by the ambiguous position of the Pemuda as a central identity of the Republican state itself. These findings were interesting for me as an Indonesian that has these preconceived ideas based on the national narrative of the revolution, that the Pemuda identity was so controversial amongst Indonesian themselves shows that there are many aspects of this revolutionary world that we can discover together. Thank you for this opportunity. On behalf of the Indonesian research team, I would like to share information about research activities and outcomes that we have been working in the last years. To start with, it is important to stress here why we are joining this project in the first place, especially as part of the regional study research project. The first one is long-standing partnership and cooperations between UGEM and the KITLV in doing collaborative research about Indonesian history. This is very important, and this shows the existence of mutual trust and understanding between the two institutions. The second one is that UGEM team has the independency in doing the research, including in formulating research team, selecting methodology and perspective, and in recruiting researchers. Third one is that the research to be conducted with academic approach based on the principle of mutual respect and openness. And fourth, this collaboration is meant to promote scientific dialogue between Indonesians and that historians over this particular period. In our perspective, this collaborative research is also very important to Indonesia for several reasons. Namely, first, this period has been understood as an important period, yet research about it has been dominated by state narrative with less academic approach. Hence, secondly, we see there is a need uh, to stimulate academic research in order to produce publications and to develop database about this period which can be beneficial for futures and sustainable research about this period. Importantly, there is also a need to produce a new generation of Indonesian historians who work and specialize on this period and are able to engage in international debate about Indonesian history, especially concerning this particular period of 1945-1949. So, Based on the above mentioned considerations, we design our research in the following schemes. The first scheme is so-called main research project, which consists of 11 researchers who work together with Dutch researchers. And they are coming from different universities in Indonesia with various academic qualifications. Five of them are postdoctoral researcher, two of them are PhD researcher and four of them are master or pre-PhD researchers. Aside from the main research project, we also designed the second scheme that we also call as additional research project, which consists of the following research activities. The first one is BA student research and BA thesis writing, BA thesis publications, uh, documentary movie making, master and PhD thesis writing. Concerning the main research project, the 11 researchers working on various aspects of the Indonesian revolutions, which cover the following areas, West Java, Central Java, Yogyakarta, the capital of Indonesian Republic at the time, East Java, Aceh, North and West Sumatra, and South Sulawesi. They are expected to produce an article for an edited volume together with Dutch researchers. 
and also an article to be published in a peer review journals and also a database. Meanwhile, for the additional project, students are expected to write a BA thesis, master thesis, an article to be published on a special issue of Lembaran Sejarah, the journal published and organized by the Department of History of UGM. In addition to that, it will be also published two books. First one is a compilation of BA thesis written by previous students in UGM about the Indonesian Revolution. And the second one, a monograph which partly contains selected papers presented in a series of workshops uh, that were organized by UGM team during the years of, of, of research. To conclude these presentations, I would like to highlight two important points. Yeah. Firstly, all research and papers resulted from the project are trying to show the complexity of Indonesian revolutions period of 1945-1949. Altogether, they represent the revolutionary world of Indonesia, the title of our books, in which violence and war appear as important, but it's not the only aspect or reality of the revolutions. And secondly, the revolutions of Indonesia has different meaning for different group of society in Indonesia. Finally, we would like to thank you very much and really appreciate the opportunity to be part of this research project. The next part of the program deals with the extreme violence in the first phase of the Indonesian Revolution, known in the Netherlands as the Besiap. This research was carried out by the historians Esther Captain and Ono Sinke. Esther Captain is a senior researcher at Kit LV, and Ono Sinke is a senior policy researcher at ARC, Knowledge Center for War, Persecution and Violence, and was seconded to Kit LV during the research. The research will be published in April under the title The Sound of Violence, Bersiap and the Dynamics of Violence During the First Phase of the Indonesian Revolution. Both researchers first give a short presentation about the working method and the results of their research, after which Hans Goedkoop asks them some questions. Esther, go ahead. Bersiap, a term that was prior only known to eyewitnesses and historians, and it has now become a household name. Bersiap, be ready, was the attack lo uh, slogan for the Indonesians. They wanted to depend, defend the independence. It's the name for an extremely violent period, the Bersiap period, that, not, that reminds us of horrible experiences for which in the public domain in the Netherlands there was no space to talk about. Bersiap was anti-colonial violence against Indo-Europeans. And not only that, our research that starts on the 17th of August, 1945, demonstrates that we should look at this violence in the right perspective, also connected to the violence against civilians and also against fighters of other parts of the populations and nationalities, Moluccans and other Indonesians that had fought on the Dutch side or were suspected of having done so. Chinese, the violence against that part of the population even increased after that, Japanese citizens and captured Japanese, British, and British Indian military. The extreme violence characterized itself because it happened against several groups and it is artificial to separate, separate the different types of violence. So against all these groups can be called the same thing, which was the first phase of the Indonesian revolution. The Indonesian violence focused on everybody who intended to return to colonial rule under the Dutch, everyone who was getting in the way of Indonesian independence or was suspected of 
taking actions against it. Extreme violence in that context was a consequence of Dutch colonial dominance, a response on three-year Japanese occupation and the arrival of British, Indian and Dutch troops that threatened the Indonesian independence. In all cases, we can say that this was a case of occupation and rule by a foreign power. This reality seemed a blind spot for most Dutch people in the archipelago and in the Netherlands. And this was completely unexpected in that first phase of the Indonesian Revolution. By the way, not all Indonesian violence was anti-colonial or politically motivated. There were socially economical situations that were very bad and of course there was no rule of law and therefore criminals had um, all the opportunity to commit violence and crimes and violence did not only come from the Indonesian side extreme violence was also applied by Japanese British British Indian uh, units and also to a lesser extent by Indo-European Dutch and Moluccan military against Indonesian civilians and this extreme violence was not limited to Java and Sumatra, but also occurred in the rest of the archipelago. References to the term Bersiap in the public domain in the Netherlands can be found at the end of the Indonesian independence ward, predominantly 48 and 49. Bersiap is not mentioned as the reason for the harsh actions after 1946, but as a reign of terror. There was a fear that negotiations with the new Republic of Indonesia would lead to a second phase. References to the Bersia period for a justification of sending troops to the Netherlands is a construction that happened after. It became in fashion, if you will, after the 80s, when publications start occurring. But this link was not found in the media and not in diaries of soldiers themselves, the Dutch decision to reoccupy the archipelago dates back to well before the Bersiap burst. So that concludes my part and I would like to give the floor to my colleague Ono Sinke. I will talk about a subject that is very delicate. Looking at the first phase of the Indonesian Revolution and the violence, we have listed all casualties of all sides and of all nationalities and denomination. It becomes clear that after the first month of capitulation, we know that there was an extremely violent situation and about the groups that contain the biggest number of victims are hardest to find, the Indonesians and the Chinese. With the Indonesians, we can say that it is thousands and thousands of casualties as a consequence of Japanese violence uh, and to a lesser extent also from the Dutch side. Most Chinese casualties, many thousands, uh, happened after March 46, nevertheless. Also before that time, large, uh, large numbers of casualties can be found. Also, we see that many people were captured and murdered, uh, also British mit military and Japanese civilians and military. Uh, numbers on Dutch side, Indo-Europeans, Dutch, Moluccans, etc during the first months of the Indonesian Revolution, we were able to do more detailed research. There's more information available. And our research shows that these numbers are significantly lower than the estimates of 20 to 30,000 that have been circulating to this day. Because if you look at those numbers more closely, you see that these numbers were based on assumptions. Um, or speculative extrapolation. So if so many people were killed in Jakarta and so many meeting then missed, miss, then so many probably will have been killed in other places as well. 
Also, when it comes to reliable sources, uh, certain casualties will be added to uh, war casualties from other ar areas that can simply not be traced. And that made it essential for us to look at what we could find ourselves. And our research was based on uh, data from the Foundation of War Graves and or lists in several archives. And then when you take the period 17th August uh, 1945 until 31st of March 1946, you get 3,723 casualties on Dutch side. We know for certain that 1,344 were killed because of violence. 1,006 uh, passed away um, for other reasons, uh, but not violence. And 1,373 uh, perished, but we were not able to establish what the cause was. And of course, we are never sure that all casualties were registered, especially in those times. And this is why you need a certainty margin, if you will. And end of December, there was still uh, 1949, 2000 uh, people were still missing, and um, we added them to that. And if we also add the 125 people, of which we do not know their date of them passing, but probably did pass in that same time, that brings us to a number of almost 6,000. There's no reason to assume that the number would be much higher, and it doesn't come anywhere near the numbers we've known so far, the 20 to 30,000. We understand that this is quite a message, and we are very well aware that this period brought with it a lot of suffering and pain for those directly involved, and has done so for decades after, and has had a significant impact on their children because the children did not enjoy the affection and protection because of the trauma of their parents. And I deemed it appropriate to take a moment to think about the victims that fell on both sides. Right, please step over here. I'll, I'll, I'll extract two things. The number of casualties on Dutch side, which is much lower than earlier estimates, and on top of that, the Dutch predominantly remember the violence against themselves, but there was much more violence from many more parties. So this is the message that you bring into the debate, Esther, about the Bersiab. What, does, what makes this debate so fierce here? Well, because it got different interpretations that exclude each other mutually. And I think that it is so delicate because everyone is asking themselves who started this, because whoever started it is responsible. And what we try to demonstrate is that there are different moments. And also prior to that, you have direct causes and long-term causes. So we place that in a different light and a different context. And therefore, it is also important to say this. We uh, explain it, but we don't condone it. All the extreme violence that occurred should be rejected. And uh, we just simply state that these are the moments that we have found, but it's not an approval of anything that has taken place. We disapprove any form of violence against civilians, military, and prisoners. Oh no, you get to a total number of Dutch casualties of 6,000, much lower than uh, presumed so far, assumed so far. That is quite a message. I know that you did all you could do to get to those precise numbers. Yes, we started studying. So we used the archives of the Foundation of War Graves, 
the foundation started looking immediately for information after the war when it comes to casualty, you know, local archives, Red Cross archives. So we reached out to uh, surviving uh, relatives. So a very important source. And we also did more research. You have the service looking for casualties and they were also researching casualties and how they passed away. We looked at those reports. We extracted many lists from the archives. We used the Red Cross archives. Also uh, Stichting Pelita, a foundation that captures the stories of people after the war uh, to be able to qualify for benefits. And we put all of that next to each other and looked at how many casualties we could actually confirm. And that brought us to the number of 3,000 plus with that margin uh, getting to 6,000. And I, I also understand that you also uh, consulted uh, calculators. Um, yes, we did not do this alone. Uh, we have a team that was very, very important to us and who are very experienced. Yes, uh, a delicate uh, research, and it um, is quite emotional. Thank you. Mariette, over to you. In addition to the project on the intelligence service of Remy Limpach, two more sub-studies have been carried out in recent years by researchers from the NEMH. One of them is about the actions of the Dutch judiciary and was carried out by Esther Zwinkels. Her study will be published later this year under the title The Harsh Sword of Lady Justice, Law and Just Injustice in the Indonesian War of Independence. The other sub-study relates to the use of heavy weapons by the Dutch armed forces and was in the hands of Azaria Hamani. This study, which is also his PhD research, will also result in a publication later this year entitled Grof Geschut, Heavy Weaponry, Artillery and Air Forces in the Indonesian War of Independence. What these studies exactly entail and what new insights come from it is the focus of the interviews that Hans Goedkoop conducts successively with both researchers, starting with Esther Zwinkels. Hans. Right, Remy Limpach switched from the entire armed forces to the intelligence service and you took another approach. You looked at the judiciary. So in the 70s and 90s, we know that publications were in place stating that judiciary did not act or hardly acted against uh, crimes uh, committed by. Well, indeed, uh, I base myself on what already was done, but those studies in the 70s and 90s, these were predominantly based on the excesses Note, and those conclusions uh, uh, are not entirely upheld today and also the material that they base themselves on is up for review. There is so much more out there and what you did was you categorized it systematically, correct? And with a focus Right. The judiciary, did it control extreme violence or did it promote extreme violence? What always fascinates me uh, as a kickoff, if you will, the Netherlands did not recognize the struggle in Indonesia as a war. It was an internal conflict and therefore uh, no martial law, but declared a state of war. And a What did that mean for the judiciary? and rule of law. Well, just to give you some context, uh, martial law means that you give a lot of authority to the military. So the civilian authorities are made subordinate to the military, and that touches on the judiciary and rule of law. Of course, court martials um, could actually convict civilians. So basically, uh, the military takes over from uh, civil society, yes. So court martials instead of regular courts. So martial law and normal rule of law have different 
aspects correct? Well, uh, martial law, of course, serves military interests and not necessarily the interests of the individual or a society as a whole. And that comes back in the decisions they took to yes or n not to prosecute. Yes, it was the army commanders who made those decisions. And did they prosecute? Well, to a very limited extent. There were a lot of prosecutions. But when it comes to extreme violence, this is one of the explicit tasks of our research, it was not punished or hardly punished when, when it comes to torture during interrogation, killing prisoner, uh, setting campongs on fire without military cause. These things were hardly prosecuted. Or So uh, on the other hand, when it comes to disciplinary matters, uh, those things were taken seriously and uh, taken to court, to military court. So basically, the commander was in charge of his own rule of law. Did the judiciary, the civil judiciary, protest? Well, there were some public prosecutors and lawyers who got involved in those cases and in those investigations. They did look at whether they could counteract prosecution, but they were obstructed. And they were always dependent on information that had to come from a certain uh, part of the military, military, and you need statements. And if that was coordinated, then, you know, that didn't bring them anything sensible. You, of course, had to substantiate to be able to furnish proof. And in the end, we know that it's the uh, public prosecution office that normally would decide to prosecute yes or no. But in this case, it was the military commander. Um, and General Spohr, in this case, was the one until he passed away in 1949. Um, he was the one who had to give that approval. And that made a big difference. So civilian judiciary, civil judiciary, could do something, but had to comply with the military standard. Well, just as a correction, there were civil lawyers that had a military position in that time. So it became intertwined. But they were always subordinate to the military forces in those positions. And you come to the conclusion that rule of law was used as a weapon in the context of the Dutch struggle. Yes, that is a conclusion in my research, and it's twofold. So leaving unpunished some forms of extreme violence committed by Dutch military and harshly punishing the Indonesians, so civilians and fighters who resisted the Dutch uh, reign and came into resistance. They were either put in prison and were imprisoned and sentenced to death even. So that is the same military judiciary that did those things with various consequences on both sides. You ha are quoting here, you know, if you went beyond the pale, you actually were awarded an extra star. Was that the rule? It's a very telling example because the person who said it was the head of the Central Judicial Department of the Central Police, and they were uh, the most important intelligence organization in tracking down crimes. They did those investigations, and we have a statement uh, of him saying that he personally killed 20 people, but it was well known that nobody said anything about that. And that was uh, the tone of his story. And if someone in that position can say that, you know, that's very telling. So you could say that the judiciary promoted extreme violence. Well, it did not prevent it from happening. And it gave uh, a sense of legitimacy to it. Uh, being part of that struggle, and if you commit it, 
then you knew that it would not necessarily be punished. And the argument was, you know, it, there is no other way. Yes, military interests, uh, you know, at all costs, uh, that war had to be waged and won. And you see that from all sides, uh, people went beyond the pale. So uh, there are also plausible arg arguments that you give as to why uh, commanders don't do anything because you want to keep the troops together and you want to win that war. So there is a, a huge pressure on rule of law and winning that specific battle, correct. Is there anything that really shocked you because you've been right in the middle of it for four years and you're very calm and collected? as you present it. Well, there's many shocking information that you read about and that you read in diaries and memoirs and that you hear in interviews. Uh, maybe not so shocking, but again, very telling. And what surprised me is the huge differences in the type of punishment. There was uh, different uh, standards that were applied People got away with uh, very violent crimes, but for um, misdemeanors, people were convicted to uh, very harsh punishments. And um, many people were imprisoned for hardly any reason. So that difference, that discrepancy is very clear. And also uh, the differences in punishment in um, military was also significant. It made a difference uh, in which part of the army you uh, served, the uh, KL or the KNIL, the Royal Netherlands Army, or the Royal Netherlands East Indies Army. So some martial, uh, court martials were much stricter, especially in the uh, KNIL. And that, of course, depended on the type of staff that had much more experience in uh, court martial. Esther, thank you. Ed. Right, we'll move straight on to Azaria Armani, oh, who is all set to go. And we'll be talking, because we've talked about uh, the law, the intelligence services, and now we're moving on to having weaponry in the Indonesian War of Independence, which is interesting to me, because the... You know, my mental picture of this was all, you know, it was far away places and infantry and it was all small, but it was also heavy artillery. And that also killed uh, people. The excess and nota, the parliamentary inquiry doesn't mention that, but you've investigated it and you gave uh, Kanan Anjar uh, on Java as an example. What happened there? An incredible example. Yes, that was a place in mid-Java where in October 1947 the uh, largest artillery shelling was, was done of the whole war. And I visited that place. I did, uh, I researched Indonesian sources as well in order to see what the effects were. And probably hundreds of people were killed in that shelling. Yeah, you say almost 1,000, you said, 700 and, and some people. Yes, because it was a market day that day, so that explains in part the large number of victims. And the idea was, well, it's, it's a market day, let's wait a day. No, and that was certainly not unique to that situation in the plans drawn up by the Dutch military. They almost didn't take into account any risk of civilian casualties. So what we're talking about is um, artillery support, so large material that can support ground troops. And you say it has major advantages for one's own side. Can you summarize why that is? Well, just to give an idea of the situation, the Netherlands, the, the, the Dutch army there had uh, conquered large areas there, really areas that were too great to really control with the available troops. And then um, cannons, artillery, uh, planes, they, they were a good way of limiting your own risk and using the few troops you had to still uh, keep control of an area. And they simply accepted that there might be a great number of civilian casualties because the Dutch troops often didn't really see that distinction. Uh, 
between civilians and fighters. And, you know, everyone became suspect. So you can imagine the consequences of that. Yes, indeed. So we're talking about asymmetry a lot today, asymmetry in battle. And it is an example of the asymmetry when it comes to manpower. When it came to manpower, the Netherlands were at a definite disadvantage. But when it came to firepower, they were the strongest and they weren't afraid to use that. Definitely. Did it help any? Well, did it help them win the war? Well, in the end, it didn't help them win the war, but you can wonder whether the war could even be won. could have been won by the Netherlands. It did help to keep morale up, you know, the willingness to fight on the part of the Dutch troops. So that's an argument for one's own side again. Yes, because it reduced the number of victims on one's own side. That helps morale, but also it affects morale of the opponent. So it has an intimidating psychological effect. And then they just completely disregarded the potential consequences for the civilian population and all the damage it might cause. But it must have become less and less effective when it turned into more of a guerrilla war. You know, because Indonesian forces spread out in smaller units were harder to find. Yes, over time, you do see that shift, you know, towards the last year of the war, where that guerrilla was at its most intense. And the Dutch had conquered the larger, largest area up to then. And they started using the weaponry more and more. Also, with all these outposts that only had 10 or 15 soldiers sometimes, in order to protect those outposts. Sometimes it was simply desperate measures. It was a substitute for infantry action, you know, a substitute for patrols. You know, just shell them rather than sending in troops. So really it was a sign of, of powerlessness. Yeah, really it was. So they didn't really pay any attention to civilian casualties. Can you d find out how many... Uh, civilians were killed by shelling, etc. Well, that's very hard to uh, discover because these were weapons used from a great distance often, but also it was used together with a lot of other violence. And now the Dutch well, already didn't know how many people they were killing on the other side, but the Indonesian Republic as well, which had only just been founded, didn't have the administration yet, didn't have the bureauc bureaucracy to uh, track who'd been killed in combat operations. So we cannot fully reconstruct how many victims were killed, but that there were many thousands is clear. And that they didn't care about civilian victims. That's right, in the military plans, they didn't take that into account, any uh, civilian casualties. And then if you look at a number of situations which I investigated also in Indonesian sources or local uh, studies, then you see that there were, in fact, a lot of civilian casualties. So that firepower, did that make the... Um, the struggle less controlled. So you start by not shooting unless you're shot at. By the end of the war, it's shoot first, live longer. Yes, the official rules were often, you know, don't shoot unless you're shot at. But troops often ended up in a situation where they got the feeling like it's either him or me, and that they prefer to shoot first themselves. And that's to do with the fact that it was hard for them to make a distinction between civilians and fighters. And then, you know, everybody became suspect to them. And a cynical order that was often given was just shoot everything that moves. And they didn't always do that, of course. But it does show how little regard they had for um, civilian casualties. So the idea on the Dutch side was always, you know, that old principle of... of I hope the, the surgical method, you know, we're being very precise, uh, 
the small operations, meaning casualties are as low as possible, were very effective. Then General Spohr had a, a variation on that. What did he call that, remember? He called it the Dutch method. The Dutch method, that's right. So that was like we don't have a lockdown, we have an intelligent lockdown. And what is left of that whole idea... Well, really, that method of surgical violence from Hotz's period was mostly true on paper. Even in practice, at the time, they used heavy um, weaponry, and that was an important part of their method. And it was the same in the post-war period from 1945 uh, to 1950. Spore uh, and also the government wanted to paint that whole picture of a small-scale conflict and that whole term of police actions... That was a very successful attempt to to create that picture. It's still a well-known term, police actions. But heavy weaponry, artillery, uh, planes, uh, naval artillery, they were all important means in that fight for the Netherlands. Right, so is this extreme violence? Does this come under your definition of extreme violence? Or is it just a little bit of everything and it's hard to label it? Well, violence using heavy artillery, etc., is not by definition ext extreme. Like shooting prisoners is always extreme. But what you can say is that very regularly there seems to have been disproportionate use of the, that weaponry. Right, and then it would qualify as extreme violence? Yes, uh, for example you know, you're taking revenge because a vehicle hit a, a, a mine in the road, so there's a, someone wounded or someone dead on your own side, and then you simply shoot all, uh, shell all the kampongs in the environment. Right, or the, the victim, uh, sorry, the example you started with, 700 killed on a market day. Uh, thank you very much. I'm back. Oh, you're back. You snuck up on me there. Did you want to add something, Hans? No, 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 please go ahead. Right, within the research program, a key role was reserved for the uh, Witnesses and Contemporaries project. This project focused primarily on collecting uh, memories and testimonies uh, of those involved from the Netherlands and Indonesia. In this way, the project tried to build a bridge between soldiers and civilians who experienced the war in Indonesia and the researchers. The project was carried out by a three-person team consisting of Friedus Steilen, researcher at uh, KITLV, and Evelyn Buchheim and Stephanie Welfare, both affiliated with NIOD. In their search for personal stories in Indonesia, they received support from the Indonesian historian Odi Dwichayo, who also co-wrote the richly illustrated bilingual Dutch-Indonesian publication Spore of Obedeken is Traces Full of Meaning, Miniti Arti, which uh, appears today. Please, uh, your attention for the filmed impression of the project and this publication. Getuigen en tijdgenoten begonnen in... Witnesses and contemporaries began collecting and cataloging personal stories about the period between 1945 and 1950 in Indonesia. We asked people to share with us their experiences from that time as well as their comments and concerns about the program. Pretty soon we proactively started looking for the well-known and lesser-known stories in the Netherlands and Indonesia. We mainly looked for people who usually don't talk about their experience. The many reactions inspired us to capture some of the material in a book. In this way, the wider public could easily get an impression of those stories and, at the same time, see how complex and how far-reaching those experiences have been. This has become the book, with the title Sporen vol betekenis, Traces Full of Meaning, A Conversation with Witnesses and Contemporaries about the Indonesian War of Independence. The book takes the reader on our search for all these different stories. We wrote it with four authors. Odidi Chachio, Stefanie Welvaert, Friedes Steilen and Evelyn Buchheim. Writers with different backgrounds and interests. <laughs> 
The essays in our book are based on personal experiences, reflections and places of remembrance. We used letters, diaries and memories, or memoirs, but also photo albums as a source, eco documents that were still in people's homes, sometimes more or less forgotten in the attic. The people who donated material to the archive were happy that it would be safely preserved for posterity. But not only documents tell stories, also places and monuments keep the memory of that time alive. We visited several of those monuments in the Netherlands and Indonesia and reflect on their significance. Such as the moment of Ratapan Ibu, the crying mother, in Payakumbu, Sumatra. At the bridge where executions took place in 1949. And nearby in Situju, a grave with bamboo spears. In the book, we discuss, among other things, the National East Indies Monument in Ruhrmont, which has great significance for veterans. In Bougain, near Samarang, there is a house full of bullet holes, the tangible memory of an attack by Dutch soldiers on the 5th of December 1946. Monuments continue to provoke discussions, as it turned out to be in the town of Ape last year at the unveiling of the East Indies Monument. In interviews, people took us back to their experiences at that time. We now first hear Art Janssen, who goes back to his time as a soldier in Indonesia. And exactly at 7 o'clock, as soon as it gets dark there, a lot of shouting and violence, and, and then we got our first attack. And they walked to the hole in the fence and um, they thought that it was still open and that's where they got stuck. So then we repulsed the attack. Also the five patterns and light patterns were put between them and uh, that completely closed the door. We listened to stories of people staying in Bandung around the same time, each on a different side of the demarcation line. Robert also told about his previous experience during the Bersiap in Surabaya. So one day um, we were arrested and um, placed in a cinema, the Sampurna Theatre. So, under surveillance of Indonesian youths. And um, then we asked one of those guys what's going to happen. And then he told me that Sukarno would give a speech at some point. And then from that speech, it would then become clear what they had to do with us. And in the worst case, we would be killed. Well, that apparently, unfortunately, did not happen because the English had. Uh, had Sukarno come to Surabaya. Indonesian veteran Paidi was stationed at the demarcation line during the withdrawal of Indonesian troops. So we got together on the evening of the 23rd and my group had to patrol Bandung station. We had to keep an eye on attacks from the north. And the station was near the governor's office. And uh, I patrolled until midnight. We received no orders to set Bandung on fire. We just patrolled. Not a single order. But when I looked up, the sky had turned red. So that demarcation line still has symbolic charge. So like Ali uh, so aptly made clear. When I hear a lot of stories around me, I always think, yes, you missed that other side. Like I missed at school that Sukarno apparently said to Dawes Decker, you are the father of our political nationalism. Why did they never tell me this in uh, the history lessons? Why? It was against the Netherlands, I understand. But it did happen that a uh, man was giving that title uh, by Sukarno. Uh, but 
it was all of us who were in favor of the Netherlands. We did not want to know. He was a traitor in our eyes. This is how we saw those who were uh, in, uh, for the Indonesians. And that line is still there, that demarcation line, that red line. Uh, you are one or you are the other. In an online group interview, we brought together different generations from Indonesia and the Netherlands. They talked about the legacy of their fathers and grandfathers. This exchange, in which completely different experiences were closer together than previously thought, was very special for everyone. But, um, I think about when I was 12, I found a little diary of my father. And for making now big steps, maybe I can explain it later, this diary was hidden by my parents for many, many, many years. And uh, um, so 15 years ago, I found it. And um, by that time, I realized I didn't know my father at all. Can I share screen to uh, show some photo or documentation? Yeah, perhaps um, while waiting for Samsung, I, I want to uh, add um, a little bit of information again that um, I, I also actually want to ask him. Sadly, he's now uh, already passed away. But um, at the time, I also curious, like, uh, why did he participate? Why did he join to this, uh, to this group? Um, the small group, I guess, uh, that posted in the village for in the, in each villages in uh, Central Java. So I dig for uh, I dig for uh, some documentation, and I found uh, old documentation like uh, veteran ID, like uh, marriage ID, like. We hope that spoor full betekent. We hope that Traces Full of Meaning will show people the way to the archives with personal stories and that it will lead to just as inspiring conversations as we have had with witnesses and contemporaries. Via email we've received lots of questions by now from the audience and some of them will now be posed by Hans of the relevant researchers. Uh, Hans, please go ahead. Yes, one for Martijn Eikhoff, if you could please come to the front. So the question is, did Dutch researchers have unrestricted access to Indonesian archives and can those so sources also be accessed by other researchers? Yes, that's an important question, a good question. Over the past few years, in general, it proved difficult for foreign researchers to get access uh, to archives in Indonesia, also because there's been bad experiences with sharing information you know, people not giving enough credit, etc. So in the project, we were able to use a lot of uh, Indonesian materials from the archives. In part, that is in Dutch archives. Sometimes that's been stolen, but, but sometimes it's been shared in uh, by mutual agreement. And in practice, in the end, we were able to use a lot of Indonesian materials. And that is because we worked with people in Indonesia who were able to access those archives. Right, so often it was Indonesians who looked at uh, those documents. Yes, that is also what happened. So it was a, a difficult issue, but we managed to work around it, and uh, we had a good result. But there's, there might still be a lot in Indonesian archives that would help this research. Yes, as was said in the uh, videos, this is the start of a new partnership, a new collaboration. We're starting new projects and we'll continue that collaboration. All right, second question, to what degree has there been any attention given to islands outside of Bali, Java and southern Sulawesi? Well, Indonesia is, of course, has a, a great number of islands, as a huge archipelago, and we said that at the start of the project, we don't want to be Java-centric, because then you have a very limited view of the conflict. So, we um, involved some other um, islands as well. And certainly when we, when it came to the Bersiap, we, we looked much beyond Java. But yes, still, there's a lot of work to be done still.
Uh, every historian always says that. Thank you. Esther Swinkels, two questions. Someone says, well, I think the state of war and the state of emergency only apply to southern Sulawesi. Is that true, or did it also apply elsewhere? No, it was also in force elsewhere, and it's a state of war or a state of emergency, and as differences between the two. One, give you, one gives you slightly more powers than the other. And really from 1940... Once the Germans invaded the Netherlands, there you had the state of emergency in Indonesia, and that continued to apply in large parts of the archipelago. So even in 1945, once the Netherlands, you know, returned and wanted its colony back, and in certain parts of the archipelago, that state of emergency was revoked. It was then changed to a state of war. So it wasn't the same in every location, but in Java and Sumatra, it was enforced uh, uh, continuously, yes. So that was the, the heart of the battle. Another question. So what courts are we talking about here in Indonesia? Oh, well, I hope you have some time for me to give this answer. Yeah, that's why I asked you to be brief, in fact. Well, the military courts there, you're talking about the uh, courts martial. Uh, then you had uh, temporary courts martial as well. You had the um, civilian courts as well, national courts. So you had military courts uh, in the field and, and special tribunals that were uh, founded. And that those mostly uh, involved uh, fighters, Dutch soldiers, but also Japanese criminals, uh, war criminals. Right, so there are lots of bodies. Thank you very much. Esther Captain, two questions. Uh, someone has sent in an entire overview with numbers and sources with the question, so did the Pension Payment Council data, was that used for missing persons? I imagine that's for the number of dead. I would guess that's the question, yes. And the the uh, si was the civil registry of Batavia or Jakarta used? Oh, my, my colleague is joining us here because we did this study together, this research, and this part was mostly uh, coordinated by him. So the uh, pension payment council was that checked and also the civil registry for Batavia. Well, it might be good to say, first of all, that we focused on the dead rather than the missing because the missing often returned later. So the Pension Payment Council, we didn't look at those archives. And I don't know to what degree there's an archive between, uh, an overlap between the archives of uh, Polita and the uh, Payment Council. And then the, the what did you say? Oh, the Civil Registry of uh, Batavia. We didn't check that. So there's still room, of course, for more research and for additional sources. But we think that it won't uh, change uh, our results too much. But there could still be sources. Yes, and we're not saying that this is a definitive figure. There's always more sources. There could be more victims. But I don't think we're ever going to get close to the twenty to 30,000 victims. And you said something. We didn't look at the numbers of missing because many of the missing returned. But those who didn't return, they're, they're dead. You want to include them. Yes, well, in the end, we looked at the people killed, you know, after the war, the, the War Graves Foundation did an investigation, uh, so they were registered there, and I think most of the missing will have been included in those numbers. It's always possible that someone simply uh, didn't make it official, but... I don't think the chances of that are so great that it, that it would involve thousands of people. Right, then Esther, I think this is one for you. If the Bershia wasn't the reason to send troops, then to what degree was it a motive for individual uh, troops for, their, for what they did there? Well, for individuals, it could be a reason. It's mostly for those who had family uh, members in Indonesia, so that was the uh, Moluccan and Indo-European CNIL uh, uh, servicemen. You know, they knew what their family had been through. So that could have been a motivation at an individual level. But if you look at the bigger picture, then that 
was not one of the main motives. Right, it's not what, what set the world on fire there. No. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. So I think that takes us to the break. That's right. It's time for a break. It's not going to take 15 minutes. You'll only get 10 minutes. So we'll start again at a quarter to 11. Of course, you can keep on emailing us asking questions for the researchers. You can do that using the same email address, info at ind45-50.nl. Because there'll be time for a second Q&A later, and after today as well, we'll try to answer your questions as um, best we can. Prior to the break, I'd like to uh, again refer you to the contact point set up by the Polita Foundation and also <coughs> the Veterans Desk of the Dutch uh, Veterans Institute. And we'll show you that contact information during the break uh, again. We'll see you again after the break.